Lincoln, before the Civil War, is a very articulate but fairly typical northern political figure. I think his racial views are quite typical of northern society at that time. I don't think he's more racist than most northerners, but I don't think he's that much less racist either. His solution to the problem of race is colonization. That, he says this all the time before the Civil War, colonization. And I think one of the main, colonization being deporting blacks out of the country. Again, it goes back to this business of this America being a white country, a country for white people. Blacks are aliens. In one speech in 1854, his great Peoria speech, he says exactly, what would I do with these slaves if they were freed? He says, I don't even know exactly. My first impulse is to send them to Africa, their native land. Now, that comment is a very interesting one, their native land. Africa was not the native land of black people by this time. They, the, the slave trade had long been cut off. They were, all the blacks in the United States were born in America. They were African Americans. Africa was no, lo, no more the native land of blacks than England was the native land of England, because his ancestors had come from England. But he couldn't think of them as real parts of American society. They're aliens. They're not, you know, and by the way, he's not the only one. Jefferson said the same thing. Indeed, every major political leader of the pre-Civil War period virtually was in favor of colonization. You look at the colonization society, John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, presidents, Monroe, Madison, Jackson, colonizationists. Uh, Stephen A. Douglas, Lincoln's great antagonist, colonizationist. Henry Clay, Lincoln's great uh, model of a statesman, colonizationist. Jefferson, this was the sort of mainstream official policy. In some ways, it was to end slavery. You, you emancipate slaves and send them out of the country. In some ways, it was a way of getting rid of free blacks. Some Southerners said, yeah, we'll colonize the free blacks, but not the slaves. But it is not it doesn't encompass within itself a vision of America as a multiracial or a biracial society. And that's Lincoln's view up to the Civil War. Now, you can be a colonizationist and be anti-slavery, which he was. But it's only in the Civil War that Lincoln begins to rethink this and begins. It's partly because he comes into contact with um, talented, eloquent black people like Frederick Douglass, who we had never met before the Civil War. It's because of the service of black soldiers, 200,000 of them serve in the Union Army and Navy and make a tremendous impact on Lincoln's vision of race. And after the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln never talks about colonization again. He begins to realize that this is going to be a biracial society and we're going to have to think about how black and white are going to live together in this country. So there is that growth. And um, that is what I think makes Lincoln a great man, this capacity to rethink old prejudices and old views under the pressure of, of, of events. Most African Americans were bitterly opposed to the idea of colonization. In fact, some people date the beginning of the abolitionist movement, not from William Lloyd Garrison's publication of the newspaper The Liberator in 1831, which some people say, but actually in 1817, in 1816, the American Colonization Society is formed. The, the colony of Liberia is set up in, Af in Africa as a place where colonized blacks from America will be sent. The capital of Liberia is called Monrovia, after President Monroe. So this is, you know, a pretty close connection. In January 1817, the first black convention in American history is held in Philadelphia, free blacks from all over the country, and they strongly oppose colonization. They are mobilized into action and they say we are not Africans, we are free Americans, we demand our rights as American citizens, we do not want to be sent out of this country. And in a sense this is the beginning of the modern abolitionist movement because what distinguishes abolitionists from many others is not just their hostility to slavery but that they say black people must be recognized as Americans and given their rights as Americans. That's what makes them so unpopular in the North, not that they attack slavery, which a lot of people say I'm attack slavery, but they say, no, we free the slaves and make them equal citizens in the country. And that's a very uh, radical idea. Now, by the 1850s, there are some African Americans who do say there is no hope in this country. They'll never get equality. Martin Delaney, a black abolitionist, actually goes to Africa and tours the Niger River Valley looking for a place where African Americans can emigrate to. Others look to Haiti or parts of Central America. Uh, this is different. This is voluntary emigration. 
It's different to say, okay, if black people want to leave, they should, than to say colonization, the government's going to ship you out whether you want to go or not. The number of African Americans who support emigration from the country is small. It, it's real, but it's small. It never really encompasses a large number of blacks in this period. Well, a lot of the, a lot of the blacks who did go to Africa actually went as missionaries, religious missionaries, to try to uplift, as it were, the native Africans and teach them Christianity. In a, it, it's a very interesting dynamic because, in a certain sense, the black Americans who went to Liberia, Sierra Leone, had bought into a lot of the main themes you know, of American history, of civilization, the notion that America represents a higher civilization, Africa is backward and uncivilized, and they're going back not to find their homeland, but to help raise up the benighted people of Africa. And they discover, of course, that they are very different from Africans in some ways. Uh, and and uh, it's not a homecoming in that sense. It's a missionary endeavor. Um, so the number of black Africans who actually go to live and want to become part of African society is quite small at this time. One has to, in thinking about this period, the hardest thing to quite come to terms with is the existence, the strong existence of racism in the North, how people who were racist by modern standards could still be genuinely anti-slavery. And that, I think, is Lincoln's, that's where Lincoln fits. He certainly uh, holds racial views which are common for the time, and yet he's genuinely anti-slavery. I think the thing is to figure out how Lincoln could combine both of those ideas uh, at the same time. The slavery issue is what finally destroys the Whig party, which was Lincoln's political party. The, between Nor Northern Whig and Southern Whig, there, there grows this gap. Uh, they can't find a um, unified position on the question of the expansion of slavery. And by the 1854, it sort of cracks up, and, and the Northern Whigs generally go into the Republican Party. Southern Whigs generally go into the Democratic Party, although they find some other areas to go, other short-lived political organizations to try out also. Race plays a somewhat a complicated role in Northern politics in that race comes to be used by Democrats, particularly as a weapon against the new Republican Party. In fact, they call them the black Republicans, that they are, the argument is, well, they're, they say they're anti-slavery, but they really want is, quote, unquote, miscegenation. Um, they, they use scurrilous racial rhetoric, which today would be absolutely outrageous to, for any political figure to say. Uh, they have marches of white women, you know, the parades of white women with banners, save us from Negro husbands. Uh, now, very few blacks were trying to marry these women, or they certainly had a right to say no if someone asked them to marry. But this, this fear of racial intermixing was played upon over and over again by Democrats to mobilize support against the Republicans. And that put Republicans in a tricky position because race was such a volatile issue. In the Lincoln-Douglas debates, if you read those great debates between Lincoln and Stephen A. Douglas, over and over again, Douglas is saying, do you believe in Negro equality? Lincoln believes in Negro equality. You know, watch out. This is what Lincoln is trying to do. He's a black Republican. Lincoln answers somewhat ambiguously. On the one hand, he says, no, I don't believe in Negro equality. Lincoln doesn't use race against Douglas, but he has to defend himself on this charge. And he says, I don't. No, I do not believe in Negro equality. I'm not in favor of Negroes voting. I'm not in favor of them holding office. I'm not in favor of them serving on juries. I'm not in favor of them uh, marrying white women. But there is one thing he will not say. He's, uh, that's, he says, but I do believe that blacks are human beings and entitled to the natural rights of all persons. What are those natural rights? The Declaration of Independence lays them out. Life, liberty, therefore slavery is wrong, and the pursuit of happiness. To Lincoln, the pursuit of happiness is that free labor idea, the idea that you can rise up in the social scale. Blacks may not be equal, they may not have the same rights, but they should be given the right to improve their condition in life through their own labor, through their own effort. That is a position Lincoln sticks through all the way this period. Lincoln essentially sees slavery as a form of robbery. It is robbing the labor of one person and having it appropriated by someone else. And that is wrong. And Lincoln believes that on the question of just the right to the fruits of your labor, blacks have the same equal right to that as anyone else. So he's not as racist at all as the Democrats. On the other hand, he's certainly not an egalitarian as a guy like William Lloyd Garrison or Wendell Phillips would be, who would say African Americans are entitled to absolutely the same rights within American society as white people are.
Alexis de Tocqueville, when he toured the United States and then wrote in the eight, early 1830s and then wrote his great book, Democracy in America, French visitor, commented that racism seems to be most strong in those states which have never known slavery. And that Illinois is one of them. The states which were carved out of the Northwest Territory where slavery had never legally existed, he was struck by how pervasive racism was there. Why? One could come up with reasons, partly because a lot of the initial settlers were from the South and brought racial prejudice with them, partly because it is a very competitive society, the social structure is not as fixed as in the East, and there is this fear of competition from blacks, but there are so few blacks there, it's kind of hard, blacks taking their jobs? I mean, there are hardly any blacks, there's no chance of a lot of blacks taking the jobs of white people. They, the people who moved west had a vision of American society as a white society. This was their kind of mental map of the country. And they just did not want African Americans there. Also, they're pushing Indians out of the way. In other words, race becomes part of the definition of that society. Indians pushed out, blacks not wanted, it becomes a white society. And for a person like Lincoln, who is a politician, um, that's a sentiment, as he says in one of his speeches, a universal sentiment, whether well-founded or ill-founded, cannot be ignored. Religion plays a very big role in the abolitionist movement. Many, many of the abolitionists are inspired by the religious revivals of this period, and which, which inculcates a notion of cleansing society of sin, and they think of slavery not only as a political issue, but as a, a religious issue. It's, a, it's morally wrong. It's sinful to, some of them say, it's, it's a usurpation of the power of God, so to speak. No human being should have this power over, over another human being. Uh, so it's, it's a, um, it, religion does inspire many, I mean, you can go back to the Quakers, who were the original abolitionists. Um, now, Lincoln is unusual among anti-slavery people in that he's not a church-going person. Uh, he reads Thomas Paine, The Age of Reason, which is a critique of the Bible and of revealed Christianity. Lincoln knows the Bible, he quotes the Bible, but he's not a church-going man. He's maybe the, one of the least religious people ever to become elected president in our country. Today, politicians wear their religion on their sleeve. They are constantly having prayer breakfast in the White House and being filmed going to church every Sunday. Lincoln didn't feel the need to parade whatever his private uh, religious uh, sentiments were. During the Civil War, he does come to be more religious in his expressions, and he comes to see the war as a kind of God's punishment on the nation for the sin of slavery. And in a way, it's to deflect his own responsibility for all of this death and destruction, and uh, that, that it's really God's will, so to speak. Um, but uh, Lincoln suggests that there are very important non-religious roots of the anti-slavery movement, and particularly the Declaration of Independence and this concept of rights and equality uh, and free labor, which are not religious views, can, can lead you into an anti-slavery stance as well as the more religious sentiments.